Welcome back to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, and with me is my uh, guest and, of course, my co-host, Martin Nunley. And we got a lot to talk about, so let's jump right back into it and let's uh, let's continue. Thank you. Well, look at, look at the Hexum heads. Everybody's always asking me about that. Those children found those heads. They were like Celtic or Druidic, whatever, <clears throat> and they took them into their house. And next thing you know, wackiness ensues and there's this werewolf in their house. I did a, sh- a show on the. Uh, I did a show called the Serbian Werewolf, <clears throat> and if if anybody's listening, they want to go back and check that out. That one was a case that me and my brother covered, and we were skyping with these people and talking to them, and they were showing us a. a speaking of the Templars, they showed us a Templar sword that they had excavated because what they essentially had happened was the guy had inherited a a Serbian castle. And, or, or it was either he inherited it or he, he, he got it and, and it was, but he, he, it, he had, it took him like 20 years before he could move into it because of the wars. It had changed. It's like Barry Cabon Tweed is like a, you know, like that place in like in, in uh, England, Scotland, whatever. It had changed hands multiple times, you know? So when you have these, the, the, and it was like one side would take it and have it for a decade. Then another side would take it because it was on the Serbian, Croatian, uh, and, and there, you know, all that Yugoslavia, the fractured, the fracturing of it, you know, and then the war in Kosovo. So it was a borderland castle. And the guy worked in Slovenia. He was, he was a, uh, uh, like a broker or whatever. He, he's, you know, business guy, always traveling while well, his wife would be alone and they had servants. They, they, redid the barracks what was originally ancient barracks and they and they had had uh, fixed that up and they were living in those and they were digging and and redoing the the castle the walls themselves everything else was kind of gutted and so but the walls were still intact and they dug up what they told us was like a sarcophagus um, and they said they could just feel the pressure and the energy when it was opened and it was a wolf-headed looking creature um, and then the Smithsonian came or some people claiming to be from the, the, the Smithsonian Institute. And then they took it to London and they said they never got it back. And then like, like several years later, they got paid like several million dollars, um, because they, they were like, look, we're going to, you know, we're going to sue you if you don't return this, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And so the case went on and on. And then they finally were given like money or something restitution for, they said it was lost. Okay. Yeah. So I thought, yeah, that's ridiculous. Well, this uh, basically eight, nine foot tall creature started appearing at the foot of the bed and there was a sword with the Templar symbol on it. And it was at the foot of the bed in a chest. And this creature was appearing at the foot of the bed, trying to open the chest on multiple occasions. Um, It was even shot at and the bullet just like went into the wall and it was like it was like an ethereal being, but it but it could manifest itself as physical, and then it was seen coming out of a portal, and it grabbed one of the the uh, housekeepers and tried to pull her into this portal, and it just freaked her out. She screamed and freaked out, um, you know. And so to me, that smacks of a demonic entity, but it did have a, a precedent of a physical body. Yeah. Now, what that was, why it was buried with that sword what that creature was or what it had to do with anything. Like it was like a giant with a wolf's head. I have no idea. Yeah. That would be, that would definitely be messed up. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just like, when you look at this case, um, it's like what you said about the, the Ed and Lorraine Warren case. It's very similar to that because, um, I, I think you're dealing with a form of like, uh, demonic, uh, possession, oppression, um, after going back and getting, and I should probably do an update on that story because I went back a couple of years ago and got back in touch with the, uh, the husband and, and of, of the, of the couple. And, you know, after they had finished living and they, they eventually moved and they, they went and they, they started living in Sylvania and they, 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 they sold the property. I don't know who owns it now or whatever, um, but he said that they had started complaining about some weird stuff happening and they had told them, they said, look, this, there's this weird thing that goes on here, you know? Uh, and so they were taken aback at that. It was actually true that it really, that there was really this haunting that was going on. 
Um, it did slow down considerably once they reburied the sword. Um, because that's what I told them to do. I said, you need to get rid of that sword because that's probably not correct. Um, to have that, because if this thing is obsessing over it, that's what it wants. Well, I guess, um, the people that moved in, they triggered it or something somehow. Uh, they like this, the haunting and it kind of started back up. And, and so I think that when things change, it can set off, you know, these happenings, and I should probably do an update on that. But and there, there's a lot of weird stuff that goes behind that. And one of the housekeepers uh, became, I guess, for all intents and purposes, possessed. Um, I, like eyes rolling back in the head and joints and, and limbs popping and snapping and snarling and elongating face and all this other stuff. Um, so I, I don't know. It's just really weird. Uh, but do you guys know anything about, if, if you, if you've probably heard of this, the Irish elemental it? Yes, I have. Yes. In Lep Castle? Um, no, no. This one was in, it was in, uh, it was a Serbo, Serb, Serb, Serbo-Karatic area um, in Serbia. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. The, that castle um, that you're talking about, it was it was in the, uh, the, the Oubliette or whatever. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So I believe the the castle you're referring to, Patrick, is called Leap Castle. That could be. Yeah, I may have mispronounced that. Yeah, and uh, Leap Leap Castle is that. That's not the uh, the one. The Serbian one. The one else is a small. Um, like it's it's a small enough to for them to live. You know, like it and, and not have to have a huge. You know, Downton Abbey staff or whatever. Yeah, um, there 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 was like bad stuff that happened there like long time ago, but uh, like I was saying, I, I knew someone that d- during an exorcism that the uh, Irish elemental manifested mm-hmm. and it was, it was a messed up thing, but, but this individual had seen it um, in childhood and then eventually it quit seeing it. And, uh, when when she quit seeing it, it was because at that point it possessed her. Mm. So it was it was very strange, but uh, <laughs> it was really weird when that when that one came up. It was very strange, and the things it said were very strange. Well, like and, and this happened. Did this happen at Leap Castle in Ireland? No, it, it no it happened. Uh, it happened here in the United States. Oh, but it but was a, person- a type of elemental. The, the person was of uh, Irish uh, descent or mm-hmm. uh, nationality, and it was uh, linked to a generational curse. That's a, there's a lot of that, especially like if you look at the Irish traditions of like the banshee. Yep. Yeah, yep. and and people have told me of Irish descent. People have said that they've heard screaming or wailing. Um, yep. What what I'll tell you about it is I've done some research on this. That there is a um. A Mexican folklore, it's of La Llorona. And La Llorona is basically what they call the crying lady. And and yeah. the crying yep. lady is only re- – it's found in Mexican culture. It's not a Latin thing. It is not a Latino culture. It's not a Hispanic thing. It's strictly Mexican. And I, and I think the reason is is because it goes back to the siege of Tenochtitlan when, when the Spaniards were, were – uh, uh, laying siege to the city and they were which and actually actuality they were being laid siege to because they were on the inside at that point and the Aztecs were on the outside and they were actually so it was kind of the opposite but anyway the city was falling and all night long there was a woman that was heard wailing in the final day of the battle final night whatever and she was like my children my children we are lost so over time the legend became uh, of a woman who had drowned her children. There's all these different versions of it and why she did what she did. But, uh, that the, she was, uh, she wanted this man that was married and he didn't want to be with her. So she sacrificed her kids to the devil. Another version is that she, she drowned her kids in the river. That's always the same though. They were always drowned in water. That's why she's seen around water. And so w- what ends up happening is she, um, she manifests to it, it going across the water and she's wailing, uh, I want my children, my, I want my children. But the legend, I think, goes all the way back to the siege of Tenochtitlan. I think it's, as we say in Spanish, in the sangre, like in the blood. 
And I think what it is is, like you said, a generational curse. I think it goes beyond that. I think it's an entire, uh, like a, a whole curse of an entire people. And, and I think it goes back to like a Tulpa type thing where these people um, have put so much stock into this that it, they've created it. They, they've created La Llorona by their belief. It's like an archon, you know, they, they've created this archon uh, and, it, and this thing has power. And I think that, that, that when I've, I've heard of like Mexicans being by the river, um, people of Mexican descent, you know, and they'll be with black or white people or even like one story I heard where they, this guy, he was with another like a Cuban and Puerto Rican friends of his, you know, and, and I've heard this over and over again and they don't see it. They will not see, they'll feel something, but they don't really see what the peop, the Mexican people see because the Mexican people are taught from when they're kids. We grew up with these stories of La Chusa, Manos Paludos. We grew up with all these stories of, of, of these, the hairy hand is what the Manos Paludos is. And then, you know, when you're reading um, this, this folklore and or hearing these stories told to you, uh, you know, about all this stuff, La Chusa, you know, the hambre lobo, the cadejo, then it becomes real. You know, at some point when I saw the, the hambre lobo, you know, then I knew that other things were real. Um, and my nephew, Anthony, has had his own run-in with La, La Llorona, and so did my mother, my mother and her sister, my uh, nephew's grandmother. So, you know, that they had, you know, th th this is, you know, this is a real thing, you know, and she's telling us, look, we saw this woman coming across the San Gabriel River. And I think that it's, it's a, a Mexican belief, um, you know, and so they hear the, the cries of this creature, or whatever, but the, the Irish have the same thing. It's a banshee, but it's only heard by them. Like I was a woman that told me that she heard screaming like in the middle of the night, you know. And she was staying at a motel. Uh, in the, and she was staying in a motel in uh, Memphis. And she woke up to hearing this screaming, like just like it just ear piercing screaming. She tells her husband, You didn't hear that? Or her husband's actually Ukrainian descended. And he was just like, Nope. <laughs> you know, I don't hear that. And she was like, But her children did. And now what's interesting is she had three children. One of them was technically uh, her niece, but she had been adopted. Um, and but but she was uh, like, uh, how do you say it? like? Um, it was her niece, but not. It was it was she was not technically related to that to that side. Uh, the niece was actually her sister had married a Hispanic man, and that was his daughter from a previous uh, a marriage, and they had both died. The parents had been killed in like a fire, and so she adopted that that kid when she was very young. And I thought that was very interesting that that child did not hear the scream. Neither did her Ukrainian descended husband, but her two children, who were from a previous marriage, you know that they heard it, and so did she. Now after the screaming, she gets a call three in the morning, about an hour after the scream that her aunt had died. Now that is freaky because that's definitely a banshee. I mean, what else could that possibly be? I have a couple cases like that, not a lot, but I've gotten a few and that was a weird story. And somebody asked me, she's like, do you, do you think that this could be real? Cause that was her best friend. And then I messaged with that person and just got the story, whatever. But it, it's, it's very interesting when you, when you look at that case, you know, and you realize like, hey, these generational curses can be a real thing. When I did the Mexican folklore episode, we did cover a cadejo, a black dog, or as they call it in England, the old shuck. And it was after this particular Mexican family because they had been cursed by a bruja uh, three or four generations back. And it was still hounding, no pun intended, this black hound was still coming after the descendants and causing one of them to have a wreck. Yeah, so that's very interesting. But Leap Castle is what we were talking about. The Oubliette is an area in, and not just in Leap Castle, but in any castle where uh, what it is is kind of like a, uh, um, like a, like a, like a place where they would throw prisoners, kind of like a dungeon, you know, um, and it would be right under the floor. 
uh, of the, uh, the people that would be like serving dinner or whatever. And the people down in the dungeon and the oubliette could literally be hearing these people up there, uh, eating, drinking and making merriment while they're suffering and dying. So it was a horrible way to die. You just That's lay there horrible. until you, you die of starvation or dehydration. Um, or you were thrown onto spikes, which happened, you know, pretty, pretty often, um, oh, and it was a horrible. pretty horrible, horrible. And I went Leap Castle in particular. There were multiple bodies of skeletons uh, that were found uh, thrown into the uh, the oubliette. And I believe that the, that the last known victim uh, in Leap Castle of the oubliette and the spikes were was like someone in the 1800s. Like so, they, they like they found like a a coin or a watch or something. I don't know the whole story, but anyway, I've I've read it a long time ago. But that's that's where the elemental. There was an element, what they called the elemental that roamed that castle, and it was like black, sunken in eyes. And the the elemental, uh, the idea of the elemental is a very, very weird uh, because then like they correspond to uh, earth, wind, water, and fire. And I know that fire elementals can literally burn your house down. It didn't. It wasn't there a fire at that castle. Yeah, I believe so. I think so. I think there was. I I, I was thinking there that I had heard that. Or I, I had read it. But it's a weird thing to see manifest and it identifies itself as that. You know, that's a not something you run into very often. Yeah, I mean, when you look at like the, the different uh, legends and stories that, that, that go along with what these, uh, for all intents and purposes, demonic beings that call themselves elementals um, or that we call elementals, they, they correspond to the elements. You know, like the the sylphs, you know, and the undine. Undine are like in the the water, and the sylphs are in the sky. It's like it's like different versions. Like the jinn are, are from Arabian area. They they it, which is, goes back even further than than Islam, and they are considered to be uh, of smokeless flame. They're made of like a flame that has no smoke, and then there are the Creatures of the water, you know, like I said, the undine, and then then the earth, earthen creatures. There's a whole plethora of them too. Uh, it, it it gets really deep when you start digging into it. Like gnomes and elves, I think elves would be the proper term, but um, they live within the earth. You know, um, the Book of Job always freaked me out because it was like, you know, when God asked Job, "Where have thou been?" He says, "I've been walking to and fro upon and within the earth," which is like I was like, what? <laughs> And I remember as a kid thinking when I was laying on the ground one time we were at a at a park and we don't we got on a field trip to LB, LBJ Ranch and I was laying down on this field like we were laying there on this little hill and I remember thinking the devil could be below me in the earth. you know what I mean it's like these weird things you know in your mind um, but it's it's true I mean and then it gets even weirder when you start looking at the Bible and breaking it down the Book of Job actually predates Genesis yeah. It is very right. weird. And then you start looking at the codices, the 36 books on the Nagamati Desert, um, and you get all these different you get all this different information. I am of the opinion that Jesus actually for 20 years he's gone in the New Testament of the the KJV. So when you look at the KJV, you're going like, okay, he was gone for 20 years. What was he doing? I believe that he traveled the Silk Road. And I think he some believe he may have even taken a boat and gone to the West. But I think that what happened was after he died and was resurrected, that's when he appeared to, to people in the West. And I believe that I honestly believe that he could be the root to the legend of the, of the, of the natives in Mexico referring to Quetzalcoatl. Um, and it wasn't just the Aztecs. There was the Zapotecs and Mis Mixtecs. You know, the Mesotecs, they, they were all like a loose confederation that made up the Aztecs. The Aztecs basically conquered all their little neighbors and then they became the Aztecs, you know, um, with the exception of the Tlaxcalans who were just beaten down into a little corner and they, they never surrendered until the Spaniards came. And then they all got together with the Tabascans and then they just, they defeated, they overthrew the Aztecs. Um, but they couldn't have done it without the help of the other natives. But the bottom line is, they had a legend of a white haired man that was supposed to return one day and, you know, whatever, fix everything. Um, but I, what happened, and you can kind of go back archaeologically and look 
and see where things kind of went off the rails for the Aztecs and how they ended up be committing human sacrifice on a scale that we've never seen in, in archaeology, um, archaeologically anyway. It, there, it goes to, into, into one a particular uh, high priest that was under a, a certain emperor, and that that's kind of where it started and whatever. I'm not going to get into the whole dissertation, but you know, because that's a historical thing. But, anyways, it goes back to that, and then their um, their whole belief became about sacrifice and murder and killing, and and it, it was pretty. It's pretty horrific, but. Um, I do believe, though, that that generational uh, curse the, of the La Llorona, I, th I think La Llorona started there. That's where you can pinpoint that. And now where the, the Banshee comes from, I have no idea. Probably goes back to the point where we can't even, you know, to the picked Celt. Who knows? You, you know, um, like I said earlier, before St. Patrick was in Ireland, they were very, very pagan. They were into some weird stuff. So you never know, honestly. There's, I'm sure all kinds of doors get opened in those kind of cultures, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's hard to tell. I got a question for you, Patrick. Um, you know, in your in your experience and what you've learned in dealing with, as you are a Protestant, right? A Protestant exorcist, yes. basically. Yes. Yes, and, and when and when you have demanded of a an evil entity or spirit, um, ha, do, do you ask them to to say their name, right? That's how it's. That's how you have to get control of the situation. Yeah. Basically, I'm here, here's what I'm looking for. I'm I'm looking for um, who they are, um, what legal right they have to be there. Um, you, you, I mean, you're going to want to identify um, what what right gave them, or you know, what gave them a legal right to be there, and and then who they are, and then you're going to basically undo that. You're go, you're going to be, which one way of doing that is making them renounce their own legal right to being there, uh, because then they're confessing their own doom, basically. You know, it. Um, but those are the main things. Yeah, I want to know who they are because um, I think, number one, when you know, okay, I'll give you an example. If you know the demon's name. Now, a lot of times if I'm dealing with a Jezebel spirit, when that thing comes up, I don't even need to, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll confirm, but I know it. I know its attitude. I know the way it comes across. Uh, very, very arrogant. <clears throat> and <laughs> I know that one, you know, but... I'll still confirm that that's what it is, but okay. If if they have a Jezebel, there's going to be there's going to be like one of probably four or five different ways that thing got in. Um, it's either going to have gotten in through a generational curse through some kind of witchcraft in the ancestry. Um, very probably most likely, um, it got in through some kinds of of uh, sexual abuse that that person went through. Or something really traumatic like that. Um, by knowing those things, like a lot of times you can identify, you can figure out how the demon got in by who it is and what its name is. Because its name, if you know its function as well, then you're going to be able to under or, or uh, basically figure out and understand um, what opened the door to this thing. Like if a person, let's say a, a, a kid gets abused really bad. So they determine that um, they, they want to control everything so no one can ever hurt them again. Well, that's understandable, but eventually that controlling spirit gets overrun with, you end up with a demon that is extremely controlling and that has to be dealt with. But also a lot of times healing needs to happen to that person for what they went through. If it was an abuse situation, you know, so so they can be healed. Uh, you know, of all the all the the trauma that they experienced. Um, witchcraft will open a person up to a Jezebel spirit as well, because uh, the whole purpose of witchcraft is controlling others. So, by conjuring demons to control others and doing all those things, your 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 whole purpose of it of doing that is control. So, therefore, a Jezebel is a controlling spirit. Good, there's a good chance you're getting that. Um, and then that's a curse again that can go on through generations uh, after that person. 
Yeah. It's it's weird because a lot of times it, things inadvertently become. Um, you know what I mean? Like like someone goes out of their way to try to to, to not do something or not be something, and then it happens. Yes. By, by their own, <clears throat> you know what I mean? It's weird. Like, yep. like sexual abuse and, and like you said, just like certain, and, and this is an analogy, but certain medications, like it's like if you, they're meant to do a certain thing, but if you take enough of it, it causes the problem. Yeah. And, and you're going like, okay, you're back to square one. Um, but that's just the, 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 the sort of the nature of the, of the of existence in itself. It, it's a circle. You know what I mean? <laughs> it yeah. is. It's just it's just a big circle. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something I learned that is, I think, happens more often than we know, because it's a great defense if you're a demon, and that is the uh, deaf and dumb spirit. That's in out of uh, Mark chapter nine, and that spirit won't really talk. It's deaf and it's dumb. It won't really talk. So you don't know it's there. But it gets worse. If it does manifest and it doesn't talk, if you have not fasted, you cannot cast it out. And a, a lot of the versions of the Bible have taken out a, a, a key element of Mark chapter 9. And that is that... Uh, you know, the, the, this guy brought his son to the disciples. His son was possessed with a demon and the disciples couldn't cast it out. And uh, so so he brought him to Jesus and, and told Jesus that, you know, I brought him to your disciples and they couldn't they couldn't cast it out. And Jesus said, how long ago did it come on to him? And he tells him and it, that the demon has tried to kill the kid multiple times, things like that. Uh, Jesus says, you know, tells it, uh, come out of him, you deaf and dumb spirit, and enter no more into him. And the kid starts convulsing and everything. And then um, basically the demon leaves. And the disciples ask Jesus then later, they said, why couldn't we cast that one out? Because, you know, he had given them power. They cast demons out of all kinds of people already. And suddenly there's one they can't cast out. And he said, that kind comes forth only through prayer and fasting. Most versions of the Bible, after the King James, leave the and fasting part off. And it is part of this. You, I can tell you for a fact, you cannot cast out a deaf and dumb spirit without fasting. And the thing is, I ran into one of those before. And for about a month before this incident, it seemed like every day when I opened my Bible, I would open it right up to Mark chapter 9. And I thought, well, what's God trying to show me here, you know? And uh, and I kept focusing on the part where um, the kid's dad, uh, uh, Jesus said to him, who believes all things are possible. And, and the, ki the, the kid, the, the father said, um, you know, I believe, but help my unbelief, you know? And uh, so I was like, okay, that's telling me to, if I believe everything was possible. And, and I was living in Holmes County in this mess when this was happening. So I kept thinking, okay, if I can be keep believing, then I'll get out of this mess, you know? Well, the real reason I kept turning to that scripture as soon as I'd opened my Bible was that I, I was being prepared for dealing with the deaf and dumb spirit. And uh, there was an exorcism on this individual. And this one demon came up and it just stared at me, would not talk, would not talk. And I grabbed my Bible and I was like, that's a deaf and dumb spirit. That's why I kept opening up to this for like the last month. And I start to open the Bible real quick and it starts talking. Only thing was, it wasn't that when it started talking. The deaf and dumb was a gatekeeper. It went down, let a weaker demon come up. So when this other demon starts talking, it totally tricked me. And I was like, okay, maybe that wasn't it, a deaf and dumb then. I guess I was wrong. Well, I cast out that one and some other ones. We did quite a few that, that night that we cast out. Well, this individual ends up later is in church, like a month or two later, whatever, is in church and goes forward to the altar to pray and it feels like the demons are going to start. There's still something there and it's going to manifest. And um, she said, I, I had to get out of there because I knew nobody would know what to do. 
and she got up to leave and she was walking to the car, to her car. And she heard somebody behind her calling her name, turned around. There's nobody there. So these individuals, th- th- this, this person ended up contacting my family and went to my mom's house and, uh, they're, they're, they're telling me you need to get out here and help us. And I was so down with everything I had been going through. Um, I was like, I'm in no condition to deal with that right now. I'm, if, if I come down there, it's going to beat me. I can't do it. You know, I'm no, you need to come down because it, this, this thing reacts every time we say we're calling you. And I was like, well, I got to pray first. And I hadn't eaten since the previous day. So I thought, well, I'm going to wait till I feel that God tells me, okay, it's time to go. You, you're, you, you know, you've prayed enough, you fasted enough, you know? So I prayed and prayed until I felt like, okay, I'm ready to go. I'm, I, this is good, you know? And I didn't eat anything. I kept going with the fasting. And, um, when I got to that house, I went in a side door and that individual had, um, gone into the bathroom. And her husband had his foot in the door so she couldn't slam the door. And, and you know, because you got to watch somebody that's possessed. If they get in a position where they can isolate themselves, the demons can take over and hurt them, you know, or cause them to hurt themselves. So I'm whispering, you know, to my mom and, and people in my family and saying, what's going on? You know, I'm whispering. And, and um, all of a sudden, that thing started. It didn't. There's no way that they even knew I was there. The demon did and the demon started freaking out. And it's just like the way it's described in Mark chapter nine, very theatrical, very violent, but it doesn't talk. It, it was groaning like a mute, like a person that can't talk. It tries to, and it's just groaning. That's what it was doing. I go running down, fling the door open and, uh, I held my Bible against the person and they, they literally went unconscious when I did that. Um, we got this individual into a chair. Um, you people in my family were helping me hold the person down. Um, I was, you know, basically at that point I was like, I never dealt with a deaf and dumb before. So here's what I, I just did what I felt the Holy spirit led me to do. I opened the Bible to Mark chapter nine and started reading it out loud and I think, you know, even though that thing might be deaf or whatever, I mean, it knows what you are doing and there's authority in what you're saying regardless. And th- th- this individual was was getting up out of the chair with one of my relatives holding him down. And that relative is probably 250 pounds. This individual stood up out of the chair with, with him on her back and was scratching me, spitting on me, everything else. I've read, I finished that passage and I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out and it came out. But here's the whole thing that could have been dealt with earlier, but it tricked me because when it, when the deaf and dumb spirit is in a position of authority, all the demons under its authority aren't going anywhere until you deal with it. And by it not talking or by the exorcist, not fasting, then it can hide. So that that's another thing people don't really think about, you know, and I don't like fasting. I'll tell you that right now. I do not like fasting at all. Yeah. Who does? But, uh, <laughs> sometimes it's not. Ne- yeah. Sometimes it is necessary, you know? Yeah. Cause it can help put you into an altered state and that's, that's where you need to be. But uh, Patrick, it's been uh, interesting and we are, We've gone on four uh, hours here, <laughs> and uh, Barton, you still there? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been very interesting, yeah, very, brother. very, very uh, good. Uh, so we could probably talk for days, all of us. I you know. know. <laughs> oh yeah, no doubt yeah. about it. But uh, Patrick, like me and Barton, we always tell everybody you're you're one of us. You're part of the Paranormal Roundtable team, family, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I believe you're in the Paranormal Roundtable group, and when this drops, we'll definitely drop your episode on there. And uh, what I would like to do for your episode is to give away, for each one of these episodes, one of your books. So if you could uh, hit me up so I could buy some of your books. Do you have any that I could get that you could sign for the fans? Right now, everything goes through the publisher. Um, Let me contact the publisher, and um, 
well, I'll see what I'll see how quick I can get books. Yeah, well, it doesn't have to be any any big hurry, but uh, the fans would definitely uh, would love to to be able to give them a, a copy of your book uh, for for the show. Um, because I am probably going to pick, uh, you know, I'm going to drop each, each individual episode that we're doing. We're, we're doing like, I think, uh, how many hours have we recorded now, Barton? 20? <laughs> probably. I don't know. More than that, brother. Yeah. We've, we've recorded a lot. It's been a whirlwind. We had, uh, quite yesterday a, quite a bit. and we recorded mm-hmm. and we've, we've, we've only not recorded. It's more, more like what days haven't we recorded, but you, mm-hmm. you were on our right. hit list, Patrick, to, so we could get you get you on here and get it done and you know it was good getting and we talked and it was four hours and it was not boring yeah so we had no a good, it's 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 interesting it's very not. interesting yeah so definitely like to uh you know um and tell everybody where we can find you at um actually you can find me on facebook that's probably the easiest place um and my name spelled a little weird uh not like how most people think it would be it's uh M E E C H A N is my spelling on my last name and Patrick. I am on Facebook and uh, all of my books are available at Amazon, uh, Nightmare in Holmes County and 225th Street. And there will be more here in the future. Yeah. What, what are you working on? A um, couple of different ones. One of them is uh, going to be called Shadows and Light. And it's going to tell multiple stories of cases I dealt with. And cases that um, another person that I researched, but another person I know went through and a, 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 another individual that went to church with that, with that person uh, actually dealt with the demons in their house. It's a fascinating story with a lot of history to it. So that's going to be one of them. And then I'm going to talk about, you know, exorcisms i've done and and then also uh houses i've i've dealt with besides my own but pr- pretty pretty incredible stories i will tell you i mean um it, it it's unbelievable I'll, I'll tell you this much in 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 the wrong environment a person can get possessed and that possession can affect their health in very very negative ways and going Going through the deliverance can literally bring a miracle in their life, and it can be completely delivered of the of, of a fatal sickness. That's one of the stories that that is going to be in the book. An individual that was basically dying, and uh, based on one of the stories this individual told me, I I kept thinking, you know, I think that some of this might be demonic, and uh, and that's causing the, the cancer, a very fatal form of cancer. And so when we went to the house, I, uh, I addressed that this individual went back to the doctor and they had had pancreatic cancer and it was gone. That individual is still alive. Just watched one of his daughters get married. That was clear back in 2014. This individual is still alive. Um, I, I'm sure would not have, you know, seen the end of 2015 with pancreatic cancer had that not happened. But, uh, and it's all God. It's not me. It's God. But I mean, that's the authority. Right. That's the authority we have. If you know, and there's cancer. That's cancer, and it's and it's a disease. But there's also, you know, demons can bring disease too. If if people only knew that we have the power over them given to us by God, not the other way around, and that's the sad thing. You you'll see. Uh, think of like a little small chihuahua. Um, that bosses around a bigger dog and the big dog doesn't even realize that it has the ability to <laughs> just like eat it in one bite. Um, that's literally what we're dealing with because the power of Satan is nothing to the, compared to the power of God. The power of darkness is just the absence of light. That's all it is. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you know, the other, the other thing I'll say very quickly, because I think this is key and, and people need to know this is, you know, we have the keys to the kingdom. If you're a born again Christian, if you, if, if you follow Jesus, you have the keys to the kingdom and the keys to the kingdom are binding and loosing. Jesus said, I've given you the keys to the kingdom and whatever, whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatsoever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. That means you have agreement in heaven when you bind, you bind a demon there's 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 a thing something that happens in the heavens that enforces that and i believe it's angels 
you know, you can loose a person from bondage. When you do that on earth, there's agreement in heaven, you know, and, and, and that's a key part of deliverance. Whether you're talking a person being delivered of demon possession or a house or a property, that is very important. Uh, you know, once you identify, you know, what are the legal rights? And then you take your authority to, to bind and loose and you use it. You exercise that. So I just wanted to say that because that's a huge, that's a huge key to uh, deliverance. So, <clears throat> right. You're like a, you're like a real life John Constantine, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Not yeah. really, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, and what you've been through is pretty incredible. And I've heard lots of crazy right. stories of the power of God and power of angels. And, and I've heard, you know, angels walk among us, you know, like, like you entertain angels unaware. People don't realize that. And, and they yeah, really did, yeah. you know, there's a, there's stories. Another book I want to write in the future that I, my, my mother's mom, uh, so be my, my grandmother, very, very, very devout Christian. And she had all kinds of supernatural experiences and, um, had angelic visitations. She saw angels. Um, one time she saw them in a vision. The angel came to her house the next day. Um, after she had the vision, uh, she saw angels on their property. She actually saw them fly over her head. She was berry picking and they flew over top of her and they were speaking in another language. You know, that's, you live close to God. You will have, you will have experiences. You, the world will hate you. Let me make that clear. You live close to God, the world will hate you because Jesus said they will hate you because they hated me first. A servant is not greater than his Lord. So if they hated Jesus, they're going to hate us. But you will have a supernatural life if you, if you follow follow Christ. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely correct. And the world will come against you because th th right. this world belongs to Satan. I always talk That's about right. how he took Jesus up to the mountain and said, behold, all the kingdoms of the earth can be yours. Just worship me. Which I always make a joke that it's <clears throat> it's like a homeless guy coming up to you in a shopping cart and saying, "Hey, buddy, you know, I got this old boot and a street sign and a cup with some change. You know, follow me into the woods and worship me." Oh, okay, I'll do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Jesus is like, "My kingdom is in heaven, dude. Like, this is ridiculous. What do I want this for?" You know. But I thought it was so so funny that that would be you know because Jesus was no ordinary man, and that a shaitan or Satan whatever would even contemplate trying to do that. It's just silly to me. Um, but it's like, you know, the world though does belong to him. He wouldn't have been able to offer that if it wasn't his to offer because you're, you're this, absolutely right. This is their world, you know, and whatever happens to you, it's like, it's like with your dad, what happened with him, you know, you, you can lose your head, but you know what, if you do it in Jesus, you know, in Jesus name, you're fine because, this isn't the real world. This is the illusion, you know, and Satan is the Lord of illusions. And this is, you know, but are, we're out of time. So, guys, it's been great. Of course, uh, Barton, it's always great uh, recording with you. And <clears throat> Always great, brother. Yep. And, and Patrick, incredible, awesome, great stuff. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I've, I've, uh, I've looked forward to it, and I uh, very much enjoy it. Yeah. I enjoy doing it. Yeah, and Patrick, be in, stay in touch. And if uh, absolutely, if anybody wants to out there who are podcasts or friends of mine, my show has kind of become a hub for other podcasters and authors in the community. So anybody out there looking to uh, get this incredible man to come on and talk or whatever, just hit me up if you if you can't get a hold of him through Facebook, and I'll be his agent. I'll be like, yeah, man. And I'm just kidding. Would never do that. And that's not <laughs> that's not the way we work. I'm just joking. Anyway, folks, hit hit me up. Hit us up. Uh, you know how to reach me. You know how to reach Barton and Patrick. Uh, thanks for coming on. All right. For everybody here at PRT, Patrick Meekin, uh, Barton Nunley, myself, Mushu, Nelly, the whole gang, the whole squad, uh, good night. <laughs>